season long predictions video. So I'm going to go through every team in the NBA and predict what their finishing range is going to be. I've got a five tiered tier list tonight and what the five tiers in this tier list are going to be. Number one, championship bound teams. Number two, finals bound teams. Number three, playoff bound teams. Number four, play in bound teams. And finally, at number five, lottery teams. And so I'm going to split the NBA into its two conferences, East and West, and go through each conference separately. Uh, and yeah, so starting off with the Eastern Conference, we're going to do a top-down approach. So we're going from the best to the worst. So in the first tier of the Eastern Conference teams, we have championship bound. Now in this tier, I have two teams listed the first of these two teams and these are in order by the way so first meaning the team that i think has the best chances out of the east to win the finals this year it's got to be none other than the boston celtics the boston celtics just coming off their first championship victory in quite a few years uh, with this core of jalen brown and jason tatum being led by coach joe Mazzulla, they have been floating around at the championship you know rage for a while now and they finally crossed that threshold they had a historic offense through a lot of the season and then they finally were able to do crossover and be a championship winner uh, we saw a lot of these players in the usa team basketball uh, this past summer like Derek white drew holiday jason nato but no finals mvp jalen brown uh, just all in all, I think between the coaching and the roster, they did their absolute best to keep the entire unit intact, uh, re-signing guys like Sam Hauser, things like that, Luke Cornett. Um, I see no reason for them to falter. I'm giving them the best chances of any team in the East to repeat. They, they really have shown no signs of being any worse this year. Now, after that, we move into our second best team in the East. This is the only other team that I think has championship aspirations in this Eastern Conference, in my opinion, and that's going to be the New York Knicks. Uh, the Knicks, they are uh, in, a, in a good spot right now after year two of Jalen Brunson. Jalen Brunson coming to this team, taking them to the playoffs last year, and then this, this very past year, they were all the way down to game seven of the Eastern Conference semifinals against the Indiana Pacers, obviously dealing with a lot of injuries to Josh Hart and then the broken wrist of Jalen Brunson. They were not able to advance, but as far as roster goes, how this team has been playing, I do think that they were in a position to make it to the Eastern Conference semifinals. I think that they, they really could have. And then, uh, yeah, let's look at the roster moves. You know, you go for OG halfway through the season last year. You were very good when OG was playing, still dealing with some in issues, injuries here and there. Uh, and then you go out in this offseason, go get Mikhail Bridges to complete the Villanova boys. And then the front office, you know, they do you a little dirty. They break up the Villanova boys before we ever get to see them share the court together. Uh, Dante DiVincenzo, Julius Randle, and a first round pick all the way to Minnesota to acquire Carl Anthony Downs. Now, as much as it is a hit to the morale of the team and the vibes, I do think that overall this is a very solid roster. Like, you've got Jalen Brunson, you've got OG, you've got Mikel Bridges, and it's what I think is his best position. He is best suited as like a third to fourth option type player. When he was in Brooklyn, showed glimpses of being great uh, that first first couple games after the trade, but last season we saw he's not really a first option, second option type of dude. And I think that he's gonna fit like a glove in this New York offense. He's an Iron Man and Thibodeau loves to run his players into the ground. And then Carl Anthony Downs, I do think that he is a solid second option. Like we saw him be the second best guy on almost a first seed last year. And I think that Jalen Brunson can get him the ball and it's gonna I have high hopes for this team. Now uh we're gonna have to see how Cat fits. They were able to make their run last year without Randall at all, so I'm not too worried about the loss of Dante DiVincenzo. I think that that'll be okay. Um, and as far as, yeah, they didn't even need Randall to get as far as 
they did, so you had Carl Anthony Downs, and, you know, Cat can play the five a lot more, you know, you're gonna be out Mitchell Robinson for a while, uh, but I do trust Cat more at the five, and I, I think that their roster, their lineup, their starting lineup works out better with Cat than it did with Randall, even though both guys, like, as hated as both are Randall and Cat, I do think that, like, when playing their best, they are all NBA caliber dudes. Cat is in that all NBA third team conversation usually, and that's also what Randall has when he's healthy. Uh, guys are two, typically all stars as well. Like, uh, yeah, it, it was a weird trade. I don't know if I necessarily loved it, uh, just because it it really ruined a lot of people's dreams for the Villanova Knicks. But uh, at, at the end of the day, I think that the Knicks had a very promising season last year, and they were looking to build on it, and they can get to that next level, possibly. Now, after that, that concludes our first tier. We move into our second tier of Eastern Conference teams, and this will be the finals bound teams. These are, you know, rosters that I think are well constructed, uh, maybe a superstar player on this team, and overall, I think that they have the ability to make the finals. I'm not giving them the best odds of winning the finals, but I do think that, like, if they were to make it out of the East, I, I can see a path for that to happen. So, first up in this category, I'm gonna give it to, my goodness, the blender is going right now. I really hate everything, uh, but in this first category of finals bound teams, I'm gonna give it to the Milwaukee Bucks. Milwaukee Bucks, you know, still being led by Giannis Antetokounmpo and Damian Lillard, who they acquired last year. Uh, they also do have Chris Middleton coming. Well, he was coming off an injury, now he's, he's been pretty solid. I feel like if you saw him in the playoff run, he really shouldered a lot of the weight after Giannis went down, and he tried his best. Uh, back to back years of the Bucks getting bounced in the first round, but that is due to Giannis being injured. And I do think that if this team can get out the Giannis in the playoffs, we know how far they can go. They've won a championship with him, he's won multiple MVPs. It just has been a very unfortunate timing with his injuries. I'm not ready to say that he is injury prone, but yeah, if they can just have him in the first round, uh, get both of these guys playing well and just displaying on the court at the same time come playoff time, I think that they can do a little better than they did this year. Now, after that, we've got number two in the finals bound category. It's got to be the Philadelphia 76ers. Uh, the 76ers usually are a top four, top five team in this Eastern Conference, partially due to the fact that Joel Embiid can score like 30 to 35 on any given night. Now, this team has gone through some massive overhaul, and they have very impressive, uh, just top 10 players, I think you could say, uh, very key additions being like Paul George, Caleb Martin, uh, couple other guys, you know, they have Tyrese Maxey, they've got Kelly Oubre, they, they still have Joel Embiid, of course, um, they got Eric Gordon, things like that, I think Nick Batum is back on the team, or Nick Batum went back to the Clippers, one way or the other, I, I don't know for sure, but when the offseason acquisitions were happening, I just remember thinking like, wow, it, it doesn't stop, they just keep going and going and going, and they did pick up a lot of nice pieces, Number one concern will definitely be health if Paul George is already out <laughs> with an injury with that hyperextended knee, uh, or at least in in danger of being out. Joel Embiid has said that he's never going to play back to back again, so that is the clear indicator of worry. Like the Clippers didn't really work out due to injury, and I do think that like the 76ers could have the exact same problem where. You're not going to have your stars healthy at the time that it matters, and these guys don't always show up when it matters most. Playoff B is a, is a thing that exists. People will talk about how his game can drop off in the playoffs. Joel Embiid has never made it past the second round. If they can manage to work through all of these issues and be healthy all at the same time, yes, I think they have the potential to reach the finals. I, I wouldn't give them the best odds at it. I just think, like, history has shown us playoff B and Joel Embiid, they're not good at advancing that deep. Um, and so yeah, I, I want to say, I want to say that they can do it. Personally, 
you gotta get past the second round before you can go to the finals, so we'll see what happens. Next up, we have the third team in the finals bound category. This is the last team in this category, by the way. That would be the Miami Heat. Uh, the Miami Heat still got their core. You know, you have your Dallero, your Jimmy Butler, and Bam Adebayo. Still coached by Eric Spolestra, and I think that is the greatest aspect of this. Eric Spolestra is a fantastic coach. Doesn't matter who they sign as their undrafted guards, free agents, whatever it is, they will get the most out of them. Their development is amazing. Each year they lose a couple guys, and maybe they don't make the right moves, but they still manage to be pretty effective in the regular season. Now, last year I think it was a bit more disappointing just because of. Uh, Jimmy Butler's dad passing away, he said that, like, mentally he was not as tuned in or locked into the game. Uh, basketball was the last thing on his mind, and that is completely, it makes sense. But they are two years removed from a finals appearance, and it's mostly the same guys. Uh, I, I don't see why the Heat would not be able to do it again. So, same core, same guys, great coaching. I think that the Heat, if they were to make the finals, it's not my top prediction, but it wouldn't surprise me if they somehow were able to piece together another run in with the same core group of guys. Next up, we've got our third category in this five tier tier list, uh, and this is going to be the, the playoff bound tier. Uh, these are three teams that I think are absolutely bound to make the playoffs. I don't know about going any further than that, but I think at the very least they will be in the playoff picture. So first up, we've got the Indiana Pacers. The Pacers last year also setting records on the offensive side of the ball, led by Tyrese Halliburton. And, uh, you know, at the end of the year, they got that Pascal Siakam acquisition. Uh, we saw them make a trip to the Eastern Conference Finals. Did come as a surprise to me. I, I had a feeling that they would beat the Bucks, considering how short-handed the Bucks were. But I did not think that they'd be able to get past New York. And uh, yeah, for them to make it to that stage was impressive. Now, do keep in mind, once they got to that stage, they did get swept pretty, uh, I guess, quickly. <laughs> it was four games, as all sweeps are. But yeah, they they did not make any waves once reaching there. And they're great. They're, they're nice. They have a good season. But I don't personally believe in their ability to cross into the finals. I think these other teams, they just have more of a star power factor. And I trust them more at this point. Uh, the, the real thing with all the other teams is injury. Whereas the Pacers, even if they're playing their best like they were last year, I don't think that they're just good enough to make it to the finals. Now, after that, we've got the Orlando Magic. Uh, the Orlando Magic, actually, they could do some damage. I, I feel like they had a pretty solid season last year, finishing as the fifth seed under Paolo and Franz Wagner. Then you go out and you get KCP. A uh, huge acquisition, in my opinion. You're, I don't know if it's more of a benefit to the, their team or a detriment to the Nuggets, but KCP is a great player. And so you just re-signed Jalen Suggs earlier today. You've got decent defense. Paolo is an emerging star. Uh, really already like a all-star level type guy, but I think he's going to be all NBA conversations from now going forward. He is of great size. His, his game is immense. He's definitely one of the best young players in the league. Uh, and the Magic could potentially finish as high as they did last year, maybe even a little bit higher. I uh, just got to see which one of these other teams gets injured. Uh, and yeah, a surprise team. I didn't think they would do it as well as they did last year, but they, they made a huge leap, and I, I'm i impressed. So yeah. Next up, we've got the Cleveland Cavaliers, uh, the Cavs. They're kind of just Donovan Mitchell dependent. I think that if Donovan Mitchell is involved, you'll make the playoffs for sure. Once getting to the playoffs, I don't know about what you'll really do, but this organization with Donovan Mitchell is a relevant one. So as long as he's healthy, he'll be in the playoffs. Uh, if he's not healthy, then that changes. I don't think that I trust the rest of the roster all that much. Yeah, you got like a Darius Garland, a Jared Allen, uh, Evan Mobley, but these are just like without the right guys around them. They're just role players. And so Donovan Mitchell is that guy. He will do his 
best to try and take this team further than they have been, but I, I don't really see him doing that. I think they get to the playoffs and that's about it. Next up, we have our plan bound teams. This is two teams that I think are, uh, they have the best odds to float around the plan. And yeah, <laughs> that's about it. So first up, honestly, yeah, yeah, first up in this category, we've got the Atlanta Hawks. Uh, I'm predicting the Atlanta Hawks to be the first plan team in the East. And I think it was just really surprising that they landed the first overall pick. I'm not expecting anything phenomenal from Zachary Rizaker. I don't know that much about this draft class. I don't think many people know that much about this draft class. But for you to be at where you were last year, um, at number one overall pick, and you know, you have some solid pieces. Trey Young is on this team. Trey Young did take this team very far in the postseason once before. I still have faith in him. I know that he's been getting all these all star snubs and things, but Trey Young at the end of the day is a player that I think is great. And I think that the DeJounte Murray experiment didn't work, but he can be your best player. And, you know, with Glenn Capella, these other guys, Dylan Johnson, um, I feel like they can climb into a ninth seed. It's not too crazy to ask for. Now, coming in at 10th, the only other plan bound team that I've got out of the East, I have the Charlotte Hornets. Now, this is dependent on health as well, but the Charlotte Hornets, with a core of LaMelo Ball, uh, Miles Bridges, and Brandon Miller, I do like that trio. I don't think that the Hornets. Wow. Goodness. What a loud apartment I live in. Anyway. Uh, the Hornets, yeah, I don't think that they are necessarily advancing. I think every year they kind of just like stick around the same place. They have some guys that you think are going to get better, and then they never really move out of the like barely a lottery team, barely not a lottery team area. They've just been floating around there for a while, and I think that that's where they're going to be once again at the the very bottom of this threshold, uh, fighting for a play-on spot, they get the last play-on spot, and they probably get bounced in the first round of the play-on tournament. Um, but I do like LaMelo, and if LaMelo is fully healthy for a season, I think that they can get back to that. Now, moving into the last tier uh, for the Eastern Conference, we've got lottery teams. And in this category, I have five teams for you, all five lottery teams in my opinion. First up, we're going to go with the Washington Wizards. Uh, the Wizards last year, very disappointing. Obviously, I know some people thought they were going to do all right. I never thought necessarily that they were going to do all right. That goddamn Leonard. Uh, but I think that they have... I think that they have the ability to do a little bit better this year. Um, Losing Denny and Vija in that trade was a weird one. I don't know if I necessarily agree with what they're doing, but Malcolm Brogdon is a solid contributor when he's playing. I think that uh, Jonas Valachunas is a pretty good center, a uh, pretty serviceable center at the very least. You still have Guzman, you still have Jordan Poole, uh, you add Alex Saar, Bob Carrington, uh, still young, but you add a couple of veteran guys into that mix, and I think that, like, Jordan Poole will be better this year. I wasn't expecting him to have, like, immediate success. Also, it's like... Yeah, he's just... He's a very back-and-forth player. But I think one year in the system, with everyone looking down on him, not having all that pressure, I think that he can be a little bit better. Uh, I think that he's going to learn from his mistakes last year, and I do have faith that the Wizards, they're not going to make the play-in, but I think that they can finish a few spots above last place this year, and Kuzma was very solid. So yeah. Next up, after that, in the second team for the lottery team category, I'm going to go with the Toronto Raptors. Uh, the Raptors, they have a few solid pieces as well. RJ Barrett, Emmanuel Quickly, Scotty Barnes. Uh, just overall, I don't care for the rest of their roster. They were a team that lost to Detroit last year, and I think that takes you down to spot. And overall, still a bit young and directionless. I don't think that they're in a good stage of their rebuild. They have a couple young guys. Grady Dick. Um, honestly, 
because I do not recall who they drafted this year. I'm so sorry. But, uh, just nothing that alluring, not a young team that I think is inspiring or promising. Uh, and yeah, so I've got them at the second lottery team here. Coming in at third in the lottery team category, I have the Chicago Bulls. Uh, the Bulls, really an enigma, kind of like the Los Angeles Chargers of the NBA. When you look at their roster, they had all of these solid guys for, for a decent amount of time, and they just never really got it to work. DeMar DeRozan, Zach Levine, and Alex Caruso, and uh, Nikola Vucevic, even Kobe White making the step up that he did. Uh, all these guys that, in theory, are good players, and yet you're always, like, barely a bland team. And so now, with DeMar DeRozan gone, Zach Levine, they're trying their best to ship him out. Uh, Lonzo is coming back, but who knows what happens with that even. Uh, I do think that they are more so on the rebuilding and tanking side. They have a bunch of young guys that are exciting. Kobe White probably leading that new regime. And then, I think that they do try their best to flip Vucevic and Levine, get younger and tank. Because um, if you can get, like, a Cooper flag on this team, then you have a future. Uh, but yeah, as of right now, I don't think Chicago's trying to even make the playoffs. I would expect them to just win a few games here and there, and I think that they'll be able to do that. Next up, you have fourth in the lottery teams category, the Brooklyn Nets. Uh, I don't have a bunch of faith in the Brooklyn Nets at the moment, I won't lie. Uh, you lose Miguel Bridges, who was your best player. Uh, you retain Nicholas Claxton, and now you've got a team of a bunch of like role players, and then Cam Thomas and Nick Claxton, but the front office doesn't let Cam Thomas ball out the way that he needs to. They don't trust him with the offense, really. He is constantly not being given the keys to this franchise, and obviously, I don't know if he's like a franchise reset player, but he's a baller, and so I would, I would give him a little more. It's not like you have anyone else. Uh, and as long as Ben Simmons is on this team, I think there's bound to be a little bit of dysfunction and uh, lack of clarity. Ben Simmons always baiting the fact that he's ready, he's going to play, he, he wants to contribute. He's just going to sit on the bench and eat up that contract. I don't expect him to do anything this year. And I think that, like, the longer that you have him on your team, the longer you're stuck in the past, the longer the coaching staff is unable to address what they actually have because they're always trying to keep him in mind and it really is not there. He's not he's not a contributor. And so I I don't expect high things for the Brooklyn Nets this year. I'm, I'm a decent amount lower on them than I was last year. And then finally, out of principle, we have our fifth and final lottery team and this has to be the Detroit Pistons. Like the Pistons were egregiously bad last year and I think that they have to themselves out of that reputation. Yes, at points the Wizards were as bad, but the Pistons firing Monty Williams like year two into his giant contract, um, adding a bunch of like random fed pieces like Malik Beasley and Tobias Harris. I don't know what this team is trying to accomplish. Yes, you got rid of like Killian Hayes, but at the end of the day, it's a bunch of young guys who have no sense of how to win. Uh, everything is dysfunctional in Detroit and bringing in a first year head coach. I don't expect them to be able to turn things around all that quickly. Kate is great, but we saw last year Kate cannot save this team from themselves. And so I think it's going to be a process. You also once again got absolutely sucker punched with the five, the fifth best pick in the draft once again. Uh, nothing about Ron Holland that I know about uh, that moves me. No disrespect. I mean, that's kind of the entire draft class. Uh, and so, yeah, I maybe they get better, but as of right now, from the teams that I've seen, Detroit is the worst. And, yeah, I, until they prove otherwise, I have them as the worst. So, that is the entire Eastern Conference ranked from best to worst. If you want me to go through it one more time, uh, I've got championship-bound teams, the Celtics and the Knicks, finals-bound teams, the Bucks, the 76ers, and the Heat, playoff-bound teams, the Pacers, the Magic, and the Cavs, Bound teams, the Hawks and the Hornets, lottery teams, the Wizards, the Raptors, the Bulls, the Nets, and the Pistons. So with that, we conclude our Eastern Conference and we can transition into the Western Conference. Uh, and this is really the more trivial part. The I don't know if I'm 
using Trivial the right way. This is the difficult conference to do. I feel like the East is a little more clear cut. Yes, one team here and there might change around, but the West is hard to predict. So many teams, so good. Ah, uh, it is incredibly hard to see where where the season is gonna go. But I'm gonna try my best. So first up in the championship bound category, we have two teams. And at number one, I'm gonna give the best odds in the West to win the finals this year to the Oklahoma City Thunder. Now, you have this team, young team, that finished as the one, the first overall in the West last year in an incredibly stacked West, the most stacked West that we've seen in a long, long time. They emerged at the top, very young team, led by Shea Gilgis Alexander, uh, J-Dub, Jalen Williams, Chad Holmgren, all these younger guys. So they signed these younger guys to team-friendly deals in the offseason. They have Shea Gilgis Alexander in his prime. This is, he's playing amazing basketball at the moment. You take this team that finished first overall, and you add two giant pieces like Isaiah Hartenstein and Alex Caruso. Alex Caruso giving you defensive, like, ferocity, and Hartenstein allowing you to play Jet at the four. Uh, you also move away Josh Giddy, which I don't think is that bad. Um, and yeah, uh, just in terms of, like, you finished as a one overall, and I do think net total you got better in the offseason. So the Thunder, young, inexperienced in this past playoffs, I wasn't expecting them to do all that much. Now they have one year under the belt. Everyone's one year older. You're gonna have year two, Jet, year three, J Dub, uh, another MVP caliber season from Shea. I feel like, and I think this is the year that they could do it. Uh, it's theirs if they want. Next up, number two in the championship bound team. This is the second and final team in this tier in the West for me. I'm going to give it to the Dallas Mavericks. Uh, just because they were they're right there this year. They went out and performed to the best of their ability. Took a bunch of teams. Like, to watch their playoff run, they took down the Clippers that were a higher seed than them. Then they took down the Ma uh, the Thunder, which were the number one overall seed, and then faced up with the Red Hot Minnesota Timberwolves that had just taken down the defending champs. They whooped them. They whooped them good. And then, yes, you do fall to the Boston Celtics, but it was a very impressive battle overall. If you look at the last three years, two out of those three years, they made the Western Conference Finals. Uh, and then you make some moves in the offseason that I think are somewhat helpful. Najee Marshall, Quentin Grimes, those are good players. Clay Thompson, a solid acquisition. But the thing that scares me the most about Clay Thompson as a Warriors fan, I do not agree with the decision to play him at the small forward position. I think that the faster that the Dallas Mavericks realize they can't do that, the more likely they are to have a successful season. Because... Here's my biggest gripe with it. Four or five years ago, when the Warriors traded for D'Angelo Russell in the Kevin Durant trade, the Warriors were planning on rolling out with a starting trio of Steph Curry, D'Angelo Russell, and Clay Thompson. And at that point in itself, I was very wary about that fact. I was gaslighting myself into thinking that, yeah, Clay Thompson can play small forward in this stage in his career. Uh, he can line up with these other small forwards in the league and he can defend them at the rate that he always has before all these injuries and I think that he will do just fine with D'Angelo Russell and Stephen Curry playing at the 1-2. and two. And that was all the way back then. You know what Clay Thompson looks like at this point in his career. He is not as good defensively. Offensively, he takes two and a half months to warm up to get into the season, and even then he hits extreme cold stretches. In this preseason, he shot three of 30 across the first couple games, and his response was, I don't care about stats, I don't care about accolades. Clay Thompson, I do wish him success. I hope that he has fun playing basketball, but I don't think that the Mavericks are going to do all that well if they keep him in at small forward for the 
majority of their season. I think at some point they're going to have to have a dog. They're going to have to move him into the bench, and they're going to have to start someone else. And if they do that, I like him as a bench piece. If he can just swallow the pride and be a three-point specialist off the bench, I think that his value is much greater than what he is at the moment. Uh, other than that, the Mavericks just displayed that they can go all the way down to the finals and do it. Uh, and if you have Luka on your team, Luka is like a one-man wrecking crew. You give him Kyrie Irving, and it is a crazy combo. But Luka is just that great. He, he hasn't gotten the MVP, but really, MVP caliber play every year for like the last four years. And the guy is just amazing. I, I, I'll give them a shot as long as he is running running the show and helping. Next up, we've got finals bound teams. And here I've only got one. I only have one team in the finals bound category just because the West is so weird. And the only team is going to be the Denver Nuggets. Now, I do think that the Denver Nuggets are a little bit worse with the loss of Kandavious Caldwell Pope. You go out and you get Russell Westbrook and that's that's kind of cool for your bench, I suppose. But really, it's just about how good everyone else can dial in in the playoffs. If you get Jokic, Jokic is a three-time MVP. He shows up in the playoffs. I'm not worried about him. You need Michael Porter Jr. and you need Jamal Murray playing their best basketball come, uh, you know, in the months of May. In May, if they can play good basketball, April and May, then yeah, you can go deep again. But you need Jamal Murray and Michael Porter Jr. on their best behavior. You need Aaron Gordon playing as good as he did in the finals run. And then Jokic just has to be Jokic. But no KCP is going to affect this team, I feel like. And just the fact that they've done it, they've won it, I can see them going back to the finals. I do think they are a bit of a worse team with that loss, though. Uh, so I, I'm interested to see how their season goes. But with three-time MVP Nikola Jokic and them winning just two years ago, I'm not going to rule them out from being able to make the finals again. Next up, we have the playoff-bound category. And in this tier, I have five teams. So I gave you my top three in the West so far. These next five kind of round out the playoff picture. Now, the order of this is somewhat in order. It's also somewhat arbitrary. It's hard to say. Like, the West is extremely hard to give an accurate analysis of which team is going to be in it where. Uh, so, first up, I've got the Phoenix Suns. The Phoenix Suns last year, they still climbed to a healthy six. They were the sixth seed. Not too bad. Went on a run towards the end. Kevin Durant playing pretty well. Devin Booker playing really well. It's just the fact that Bradley Beal and the rest of the bench was mediocre. Uh, you get rid of Frank Bobo, you bring in coach Mike Budenholzer. I like Budenholzer. I think that Budenholzer was scapegoated a little bit in Milwaukee that year, and I felt especially bad for him when he got fired because of t I think the death of his sister was probably a big reason for why they performed so bad. Um, and I just think that he is a championship winning coach. You give him a couple guys. Devin Booker and KD, you saw how they played in the Bears Olympics. I think that these are two top 15 guys. And yeah, the rest of the team, if they were able to make it as the sixth seed last year, they're going to make the playoffs this year. They, they really show, like, they can do it. They can do it even with their, like, G League roster for the rest of the 12 positions, or maybe not 12. You do have uh, Nurkic, but, like, if a lot of your team is just okay, they, they can carry. I'm hoping that Bradley Beal does a little bit better, but we'll see. Next up, you've got the Minnesota Timberwolves. Now, the Minnesota Timberwolves, one of their best years in franchise history, and they go in to ruin it. I feel like you had something nice with Anthony Edwards and Rudy Gobert and Carl Anthony Towns. Everyone questioned it in year one. It didn't look like it was working. Then you prove everyone wrong and show that it is working. And they all respect you. You take down the defending champs. And yeah, you didn't do that well against the Mavericks, but everyone was rooting for you. And like, for you to have such a good season and then trade away one of the two main pieces on your team is kind of ridiculous. Uh, I think chemistry is going to take. I, I honestly
honestly think that Minnesota's chemistry is hurt more by this move than uh, New York's. And, yeah, just because, like, Cap played the entire season and he, he was, like, the second guy on that team, whereas, like, Randall was injured for such a long time, DiVincenzo was nice, but they also only had DiVincenzo for one year. Uh, whereas, Carl Anthony Towns, he's been the face of this franchise for such a long time before it got transitioned to Ant, but now to take him out of there, I, I feel like that's got to be a huge hit to the locker room, to the entire team, the owners, uh, and everything. And then, yeah, DiVincenzo's a nice piece. Randall can be good, but overall, I don't know. I, I feel like they get worse. You're going to have to see how Gobert and Randall play alongside. Like, it's just, yeah, you're, you're back in that testing phase. Next up, I've got the Memphis Grizzlies. Uh, the Grizzlies, not good last year, but understandably so, with the most injuries in NBA history, almost, I think it was, and then Jaw being out for such a long stretch at the beginning because the suspension, when he does play, they looked pretty great, and then uh, him getting the major injury, being out for the rest of the year, in that short amount of time that Jaw was there, the Grizzlies looked good. Like, he immediately made that impact on the team, made them serviceable. You've got Jaw, you've got Desmond Bain, you have Marcus Smart, you have... I guess that's a bit of an interesting trio uh, for starting, but even with that, uh, Miles Turner, you had Zach Ede, uh, a little bit of concern when Steven Adams was off the team, but you got your big now, uh, and overall, I just think that, like, the Grizzlies, with a healthy John Morant, they are in the playoff mix, they were with the two seed a couple years ago, they and like three seed before it. I, I think under Taylor Jenkins and John Morant, they're not gonna miss the playoffs again if he can stay healthy. Uh, Cause like, they're a good team and we can't forget what kind of player Jaw is. Uh, yeah, I, I have a feeling that they'll climb back into the playoff picture. They'll be around there. And I'm excited to see how the Marcus Smart acquisition works out this year. Cause I honestly thought that like, I liked it. I, I thought that the Marcus Smart trade wasn't that bad. Um, but we'll have to find out now with a fully healthy Grizzlies roster. Next up, out of the, the fourth team in the playoff bound category, I've got the Sacramento Kings. The Kings go out and get DeMar DeRozan. And last year they were, what, the ninth seed? I think that this does enough to get them in like, you've got two of the most clutch players with DeMar DeRozan and De'Aaron Fox. Uh, yeah, defense could be a little bit of an issue, but at the same time, I don't know, you look at the Suns. <laughs> the Suns were able to do it on offense, really. So, uh, I like Mike Brown, Coach Mike Brown. You have a solid trio out there with Sabonis and these two guys. Sabonis was playing great. I feel like they can be in the playoffs. I think they can be firmly in the playoffs with this three-headed monster. I don't think that they're going to do anything that fantastic, but I think that they have secured a playoff spot with this move. And then finally, the fifth and final team in the playoff-bound category, I've got to go with the Los Angeles Lakers. Lakers really did not have an impressive offseason by any means. You get rid of Darvin Ham, you replace him with J.J. Redick, you draft Ronnie James, don't connect, but no big moves, nothing notable. But at the end of the day, you just still have two top ten players in Anthony Davis and LeBron James. We saw the Paris Olympics, how they performed, how important they were to that gold medal run. They have proved that amongst the best in the league, they are firmly at the top of that pool, and yeah, if you have those two guys, I, I can't say that you're not going to make the playoffs, like as much as I don't want the Lakers to do well, I do think that they have a decent shot of being a playoff team, I'm not going to ever take that away from them, and so yeah, I'm giving them that final nod in the playoff bound category, and yeah, next up we 
have the play and bound category, and this one is honestly very hard to predict. So I've got four teams in this mix. Only two of them will make it, but I think that there's going to be four teams playing at this level this season in the West. Number one, I have the New Orleans Pelicans. The Pelicans, they add to Sean Dane Murray. And yes, that is a cool acquisition. But the Pelicans are going to play Herb Jones at the center. And I don't think that is a recipe for success. I think that the era of small ball in this league has kind of come and gone. We saw that the Rockets ran that for a while. They're, it's not working. We've seen Golden State try and stay with Draymond at the five. It's not working. You cannot survive in this league with a, a like six six center anymore. It, it's not gonna work. Uh, you're not. You're just there. Are so many talented bigs to guard. I don't think that they're gonna have success. Mostly for that reason. I like Herb Jones as a player. He is not a center. You signed Dre Murphy to that big deal. You have fully committed to the Dejounte Murray. Uh, Trey Murphy, Zion, Brandon Ingram, Herb Jones lineup, and I don't think that is, well, number one, I don't love that as a starting five, and number two, I don't think that they're going to be healthy, <laughs> just given what we know about this team, oh, you also have CJ McCollum, so is Trey Murphy coming off the bench, I don't even know, uh, I don't know who you moved to the bench. CJ was a key contributor, but that's a lot of money for, for him off the bench. Uh, I don't know. Teams have done worse. Jordan Bull. Basically, bottom line here, with the Sean Day Murray being added to this team, I do think that they, in theory, get better, but I don't like what they are saying is their plan. If they adjust their starting roster, I can like this team a little bit more. Uh, and I don't think with the health of Zion Williamson and Brandon Ingram that they're actually going to be able to get their their stars playing at the right times. I guess when Zion is on the court, he's a dominant force. He is a top player, but he's just he's missed so many games and he hasn't proven that he can actually play healthy. And he always like kind of has some weight loss and then he still gets injured. And yeah, the injuries really pile up, so I don't have a ton of faith in them. I am giving them the best shot at being a play and bound team, but I don't like them enough to give them a playoff spot. Now, next in this play and bound category, I'm going to go with the Golden State Warriors. The Warriors last year finished against the 10th seed, go out in the, pre, like in the free agency period, don't do anything that groundbreaking. They try and swing and a miss for Paul George, and then fail to acquire Laurie Markkinen. So they're running out with mostly the same squad, no Clay Thompson, but instead you've got a D'Anthony Melton, a Buddy Hield, and Kyle Anderson. So when it's all said and done, I think that the roster, it's okay. If Pajemski and Kuminga and Moody can all be solid, then maybe they're able to outperform where they were last year. Overall, they didn't do that bad. They were slightly better last year than the year before. Uh, they just did worse in seeding. No more Chris Ball, which I think is helpful because you don't have to deal with, uh, you don't have people dealing with issues on starting anymore. I mean, maybe Kuminga will throw a fit if he doesn't start, but I think he should start. Uh, and it's just a matter of like, with Chris Ball and Clay gone, you do have more young contributors, and if they can develop, maybe this team actually can grow a little bit, because they're relying a lot on those old guys, and they didn't have it, they didn't have it anymore, um, and we've seen them shoot really well in the preseason, if behind their shooting, they can do well, they have a good shot, but it really just comes down to who can help Stephen Curry out, Stephen Curry is the face of this team, he is the entire team at this point, really, can Draymond keep his attitude in check, can the young guys step up? Can Curry stay healthy? All of those, if you if you get all of those, then who knows how well the team can be. But at the moment, I can't say that they improved that much in the offseason compared to these other teams. And they, they were playing from the bottom position.
position anyways, so this is this is where I have them. Next up in the plan bound category, I've got the Los Angeles Clippers. Uh, the Clippers, yes, a somewhat deep team typically, uh, but Kawhi Leonard not gonna start for the season. Paul George is gone, and then you've got James Harden. I don't know with a top duo of Kawhi Leonard and James Harden how many healthy games you're getting out of your stars. And to me, this is just not a competitive team anymore. Uh, yeah, you're gonna have a lot of solid role players, but like those solid role players could only ever do so much for you when you had your stars, and then your stars would fall off come playoff time, and you were suffering. And now I just don't think like. I don't think it's meant to be. The Clippers, they tried. They tried their best with that duo. They tried with Westbrook. They tried with Harden. And none of those combinations were able to get it done. Now, no more Westbrook. No more Paul George. It is just Harden and Kawhi. Kawhi dealing with injuries every year. Uh, and Harden probably going to deal with an injury at some point as well. Uh, it's, it's over for the Clippers. I think that, like, yes, they, they probably are in that Warriors state where you've got some solid pieces. Uh, just a matter of, can you compete with any of these other juggernauts in the West? It's going to be very hard. And then finally, I've got, in the last spot of the play inbound category, the San Antonio Spurs. You know, you've got year 2-1-B. The rest of the team was pretty okay last year, uh, but Devin Vassell, kind of promising. Kelvin Johnson at times is good. Jeremy Sochan year one was pretty good. Now, I think he's going to play less point guard with the acquisition of Chris Paul, and I think that overall benefits the team quite a bit. And Chris Paul does improve every single team that he's on. Even with the Warriors, it was a slight increase. Yes, he wasn't starting. This is probably the ideal situation where he is a mentor. He is a guide for a young Stephon Castle. He can get Wemby the ball like a true point guard the way that Wemby deserves. Uh, not Jeremy Sojan freaking up the lobs, you know. And, yeah, I am excited for the San Antonio Spurs. I think that they can compete for a play on spot. I don't know if they can really make that a big of a jump. It's hard to say, but at the same time, Chris Paul edition, you've got Greg Popovich. That's two of the best minds in basketball. You have year one might be, like, performing at or past everyone's year one high expectations for him, and yeah, honestly, could have won defensive player of the year. The sky's the limit for when we will see how far the team follows. And then lastly, you have your three lottery teams in the West. Got three teams in this category that I think are sure shot lottery teams. Uh, and number one is maybe a little bit disrespectful, but I do have the Houston Rockets here. Uh, this team is young, and Jalen Green with his like baby mama run at the end once he had his kid it was impressive but Jalen Green that was just a, a small stretch of games he really lit it up for like one month and then cooled off a little bit towards the end I don't know if that's sustainable to expect that for him from the whole season overall just a very young team they have a lot to figure out in terms of rotation and pieces they have a lot of young guards um, I do like Shangun a decent amount I think that is a baller but there's so many well-established teams with like real stars that it's hard to put a team like the Houston Rockets any higher. And at the end of the day, they couldn't make it last year. And I think that there are other teams that just made better moves than the Rockets did. The Rockets are still young. We can still say that they have a bright future, but I don't think that time is now. Wait for some of these older guys to retire, and then yeah, maybe it's your your time to shine. Right now, it's just a little too difficult. After that, we've got the Utah Jazz. Uh, the Jazz, they, they retain Laurie Markkinen, but I, I don't think that this team really does anything. They'll win some games, for sure. I don't think that they're horrible. But with just the Utah Jazz having Laurie Markkinen, Jaron Clarkson, and just a bunch of random guys here and there, they are just asset holding. Danny Ainge is just hoarding guys. They're not actually building anything in Utah. Um, and yeah, I don't expect them to do anything except be a lottery team this year. And then finally, I think that the worst team in the West is going to be the Portland Trailblazers. A uh, young team, once again. Lots of guards. And guys who need to develop. I 
don't like their coaching as much as I like Ime Udaka. I think that Portland is at a weird spot. You've got Dominate, you've got Donovan Klingon, you've got Robert Williams. Um, you go and you get Denny Avija, and that's kind of a nice move, but like so many young guards with like Scoot and Bernie Simmons, Shaden Sharp, it's, it's going to be weird to figure out the best rosters and rotations for them. I think that Portland probably finishes last. And yeah, that is my full breakdown of the Western Conference. So once again, I'll go through all my picks uh, one last time for you guys to recall. In the championship bound category, I've got the Oklahoma City Thunder and the Dallas Mavericks. In the finals bound category, I have the Denver Nuggets. In the playoff bound category, I have the Phoenix Suns, the Minnesota Timberwolves, the Memphis Grizzlies, the Sacramento Kings, and the Los Angeles Lakers. Then, in the play-in bound category, I have the New Orleans Saints, <laughs> the New Orleans Pelicans, the Golden State Warriors, the Los Angeles Clippers, the San Antonio Spurs, and then, in the final lottery team category, I've got the Houston Rockets, the Utah Jazz, and the Portland Trailblazers. So, that concludes the entire season worth of predictions, both conferences, East and West. Let me know in the comments what you think, who you have making the playoffs, who you think is going to win the finals this year, all your hottest takes and predictions. Let me hear them all. And, uh, yeah, excited to get back into basketball with opening day being tomorrow. I know that uh, it's, it's been a minute. I, I probably won't make that many basketball-related videos, if I'm being honest. Just football is the forefront of this channel. I watch it more. I care about it more. Uh, come playing tournament time, not playing tournament, in-season tournament time, I might make a couple more videos here and there, but at the end of the day, this is more of a football-centric channel, and uh, yeah, it will stay that way. So, still wanted to get this video out before the season started, get all my predictions in, so let me know what you think, and as always, thank you for watching. If you enjoy content like this, feel free to like, comment, and subscribe. I'll try my best to down record when there's like literal parties and vacuums and blenders going off in my living room, but it is, it is truly hard. Um, couldn't do it.